Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Avoid Observability Failures. Hybrid enterprises must complement APM with internet performance monitoring. My name is Raleigh Gould and I'll be moderating today's event. Our featured speakers are Seamus McGillicuddy, Vice President of Research covering network management at EMA and Gerardo Dada, Field CTO and CMO at Catchpoint. Seamus has nearly two decades of experience in the IT industry. His research focuses on all aspects of managing enterprise networks, including network automation, AAOps-driven network operations, multi-cloud networking, and WAN transformation. Gerardo is a technologist with over 20 years of experience in digital strategies and has been at the center of the web, mobile, social, and cloud revolutions. He has held senior positions at SolarWinds, Bizarre Voice, Rackspace, Datacore, and Microsoft. And before I hand things over to today's featured speakers, I wanted the audience to know that Seamus and Gerardo will be concluding today's presentation by taking your questions. Feel free to log them anytime by using the Q&A functionality. Also, today's event is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email from EMA with the on-demand playback, as well as some additional resources from Catchpoint. So I hope you will check that email out. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our first featured speaker, Seamus McGillicuddy. Seamus? Thanks, Raleigh. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, so the theme of today's webinar is about a problem that's emerged over the last five, six, seven years. Um, about the nature of application observability and how uh, organizations guarantee the performance of the applications and the digital services that power their businesses. Um, the central theme of that, or the, the underlying issue that drives this is that traditional application performance management solutions um, offer a narrow view of digital services that was adequate in the past, but is no longer the case. Um, as you see on this slide, application performance management tools are typically oriented towards monitoring local telemetry in the application environment by looking at the application transactions themselves and the, the, the infrastructure in uh, the, um, the cloud or the data center where the where the application lives. And so those tools are typically trying to understand things like response times, transaction volumes, uh, utilization of compute resources, you know, like uh, is the CPO on this VM spiking, something like that. Um, and that is ideal for what we would call traditional IT environments or static digital infrastructure that offers predictable, predictable performance for the rest of the service delivery. Um, meaning that it can't, they, they wrote those types of tools emerged at a time when everyone was delivering their applications out of a private data center that had infrastructure that was well-defined, well-managed, and typically had predictable performance in, uh, in the, and then people reached those applications from their locations via a wide area network that was based on managed WAN services with service level agreements. And, um, you know, for instance, MPLS uh, is the probably the last generation of technology that 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 powered that piece. And so enterprises built wide area networks, connect their users to their applications over distances um, using a, a, a technology that came with predictable performance and guarantees for that performance. And then they're often connecting from corporate offices where they're using uh, a wired ethernet connection or, or more recently, you see ubiquitous use of Wi-Fi in those locations, which the enterprise uh, network operations team owned and was able to provide good performance around um, with mature tools. But it's changed. Um, if you're on this webinar, you probably know that traditional uh, observability, observability tools aren't equipped for that change because what we're dealing with now is a much more dynamic and uh, hybrid digital infrastructure um, that stretches beyond the private and predictable networks that I just described. For instance, based on our research at Enterprise Management Associates, 
um, the internet is now your network, your wide area network. 99% of the companies that we survey about their wide area network strategies tell us that they're expanding their use of public internet connectivity uh, for private, for primary WAN connections. So it's no longer MPLS with SLAs, it's a broadband link or maybe even 5G um, or 4G, uh, depending on where you are. And that's a public connection. It's a shared resource with unpredictable global performance. And so suddenly there is much more of a variable in the overall uh, digital infrastructure for those applications that you've been delivering, right? But it's not just happening there. Applications are also distributed across hybrid multi-cloud architectures now. Um, by year end, we expect nine in 10 companies will have a multi-cloud network. They'll be using more than one infrastructure as a service or platform as a service provider to host their applications. Um, that introduces a lot of variability, also um, introduces a lot of complexity, and uh, also uh, it's not just that they're moving these applications into those environments. Those applications are also may be partially hosted, like maybe a component, like a database, might still remain on premises. You, but also, but in addition, to that modern applications also rely on, on multiple third-party services to pu pull together an entire uh, architecture of, of services, right? So they might be using some sort of software as a service uh, component. Um, there might be a, um, a CDN, a uh, content delivery network, that's hosting some of that uh, as well, more locally, in a pro like in proxy form. Um, you also might be using a managed service like for DNS, for instance, for load balancing your, your applications across different clouds. And it adds a lot of complexity. It adds a lot of variability because all those services might have um, performance issues that come up and impact your application. And so you're, you're dealing with an additional pillar of uncertainty. In addition to the internet encroaching on your network, now you've got this application that's distributed all over the place. And then finally, remote work has pushed your network edge into people's homes where you have no control, usually, unless you're spending a lot of money. 94% uh, of the companies that we survey tell us that the pandemic led to a permanent increase in the number of employees who work from home at least part-time. And um, that means that they're also using the internet to connect to the network, but it's an internet connection that you have no relationship with usually. And they're also using local network connectivity, like a Wi-Fi router delivered by their ISP that you have no control over either. So you don't know whether <laughs> the, the uh, Wi-Fi router is, uh, you know, 400 feet away from where your worker is with maybe like three or four closed doors in between them. <laughs> and that's going to be a problem as well. Um, so, and there's a recognition that user experience is, of that remote work is going to be essential to productivity and application experience moving forward because remote work is not going away no matter how many CEOs try to dictate the end to it. So, um, digging into the, uh, the issue of the internet a little deeper, um, why is the internet encroaching on your WAN? Why is it, why is the WAN hybridizing? Uh, people in our research tell us that it's because they use it for cloud connectivity. So um, <clears throat> they use it to uh, connect uh, sites into the, their cloud services. They may use it to do direct connectivity between their data centers and their clouds with a, v with a VPN and uh, securing it. Um, they're also looking at the internet as, a, as an opportunity to become more flexible on how they build out their network because um, you know maybe MPLS services weren't available in every geography that they were involved in. And, and they say to themselves, well, you know, I wanna be able to have a location in this place because it's, it's the real estate's cheaper. Um, and a lot of my employees have moved there because it's cheaper to live there. So I want to have an office there. And, but I, you know, best option for me is the internet uh, for connecting that site. Uh, bandwidth requirements, MPLS and managed WAN services tend to be more bandwidth constrained and more expensive per gig. Um, and so the internet is a cheap option for them. 
Uh, also, faster to provision a, a, a internet connection than it is a, a, an MPLS circuit. Like some providers will take a month or more to spin up a connection for you um, for with a managed WAN service. Whereas, you know, depending on how busy the ISP is, they might come the next day to, to, to hook you up. Uh, and then cost. It's just cheaper to use the internet than... Um, than uh, managed WAN services. But there are challenges. Um, first off, security risk, um, because your, your, you know, your traffic is going out of a public resource, right? But um, also ISP management complexity. People are using multiple ISPs uh, in different parts of the network. They might be using two ISPs at each site. Um, it gets hard to sort of understand which ISP is the root of the problem if you are having a problem at a site. Um, they're dealing with poor network visibility overall because uh, you know they had a managed WAN service provider that usually had reporting that showed them like C SLA compliance on their their uh, WAN links in the past. ISPs don't do anything like that usually, um, and your options for getting data out of that network are with your traditional tools are limited because your traditional tools like SNMP monitoring or network NetFlow monitoring require administrative access to infrastructure, which you're not going to have with an ISP. Uh, people also complain about application performance problems, which could be um, anything along that that um, hop by hop route that the traffic takes from user to application and back, and you have limited visibility into that. Instability across multiple ISPs. So it's not just the fact that you're using um, uh, multiple ISPs and that's adding complexity, but as your traffic moves from one ISP to another, it gets to be uh, hard to tell which which yeah, ISP's router is the source of a problem, for instance. Uh, skills gaps, people just don't know how to work with the internet versus uh, an ML, ML, MPLS provider. And then inconsistent global performance. So if you're a, a global enterprise and you're trying to provide connectivity from a site in North America to a site in Europe or Asia, <clears throat> Using the internet for that, um, you know, most ISPs peer for global connectivity over a WAN backbone, and that traffic uh, ha does not is is a best effort uh, path, not um, a path that that tries to deliver a best uh, uh, you know a, a, a service level uh, that they've agreed upon for you. So and Seamus, if I if I can if I can jump in here, like I think. What you're pointing out is that the the tools that that companies have relied on, like NPM and APM tools, are still important for these companies. But mm -hmm. despite these tools being now 30 years old in many cases and advancing over decades and getting better and better, and all this talk about AI ops, companies still have too many outages. Every every IT leader that I speak with, they still have too many war room engagements, right? Like pages going off and people going to a war room, they have no idea what's going on. And there are a lot of paper cuts also, like productivity impact, especially with remote workers that that might have tickets, or maybe they just decide that the the poor connectivity is just a way of doing business, and they just learn to accept that. And it's a massive impact to productivity and cost for a company. So, so evidently something is not working, right? So, the the NPM tools and APM tools that companies have relied on for for decades are are less effective in today's world because they were not designed for. As you pointed out, the world that is internet centric, distributed with remote workforce. Right? So I, I think that's to, to me, that's kind of the crux of the problem. Absolutely. And it becomes a bigger issue when you think about how multi cloud makes things even more complicated. Um, network visibility into multi cloud is very challenging for enterprises today. Um, you might be asking yourself, why are people, why, why is multi cloud so ubiquitous? Well, people, look at it as a way to deliver like cloud native application solutions uh, to, to, to run Kubernetes clusters in, in multiple clouds to deliver sort of a uh, high availability architecture. Um, many companies are cloud first. They're trying to move as much out of the, out of the uh, private data centers as possible, which means they're, um, they're, they're, they're pushing into multiple clouds to make that happen. Uh, they're trying to be faster with how they deliver services. They don't have to provision physical infrastructure anymore. And they also have regulatory compliance issues like um, uh, data sovereignty um, that dictates that they use a specific cloud provider because it's the only one that can deliver data sovereignty capability in a certain region. 
Um, and it introduces operational problems. Only 24% of the enterprises that we talk to are fully satisfied with their multi-cloud network observability. They are trying to apply um, legacy MPM tools, as Gerardo just uh, alluded to earlier, to the public cloud, and it's not going well. Um, the top technical issues that they they encounter when they adopt a multi-cloud network to support this new hybrid infrastructure is the complexity of using multiple cloud networking solutions. So, you know, they, they're, they're using uh, components within the AWS cloud to set up a cloud network, they're using components within an Azure cloud to set up a network, and they're having inconsistent design that impacts the performance of the applications there. And they have poor visibility into how those networks work and able to, to that prevents them to from um, design a consistent network across both environments, for instance. And then the other big issue they're encountering is just poor network performance in general because of all this complexity and, and poor visibility. 68% of network teams that we survey tell us that they're acquiring new tools to improve their ability to observe multi-cloud networks. And finally, digging into the remote work issue, you see here the average percentage of remote workers who has, has, has ramped up over time pre-pandemic the typical enterprise said 18% of their workforce work from home, at least some of the time. It's it went up to 45% last year, and people told us last year that they're expecting it to hit 49% next year. So it's not going away. It's it's creeping up and it's and it's sticking around. And remote work introduces a ton of operational challenges. Only 32% of the organizations that we survey tell us that they are completely successful with supporting remote worker user experience because those workers are now accessing applications from their homes and it's not going well based on a variety of factors. Remote work has increased the day-to-day -day workload of 73% of network operations teams. 77% of companies tell us that remote work has lengthened overall mean time to repair network problems for the network operations team. So it's taking them longer to fix things when they discover things are not working. And then 87% of IT operations teams tell us that they're allocating budget to improve end user visibility. So there's a recognition that changes in the WAN, changes in the cloud and changes in the, uh, the, the network edge are all driving this need for new tools. So how do you close that digital observability gap? Um, internet performance monitoring is an opportunity to restore uh, operations to where it was before all this change. Uh, that's what you know. Gerardo's company Catchpoint uh, describes as uh, as a solution. The internet performance monitoring tools uh, monitor the internet from multiple vantage points using synthetic traffic, real user monitoring data, um, and other uh, means of measurement and telemetry. Uh, those vantage points can be in multiple places. Um, they can be in multiple public clouds across the globe. They can be in the networks of backbone providers. They could be in the uh, mobile carrier cloud. Um, they could be in your own data center, your own corporate sites, and they could be uh, in uh, deployed as agents um, or probes in your employees and customers' devices, for instance. And that gives you multiple vantage points across the internet to measure how the internet is performing. Um, it complements traditional uh, observability. So application performance monitors the application environment. An MPM, uh, not on a slide, monitors the traditional network environment like for people who are still in your corporate environment, for applications that still have components in your on-prem data centers. But IPM, Internet Performance Monitoring, monitors the network that connects more and more of your users to more and more of your applications because of this impact from hybridized WAN with increased internet connectivity with multi-cloud uh, complexity and the stretching of the network edge into the uh, home offices and other locations of remote workers. Um, because, even, because even your remote workers are, are, are adding additional unpredictability because they're going to conferences or they're working from a coffee shop or, or what have you. And, and so you need to have an internet performance monitoring solution that can account for any change in how your applications are delivered to users or customers. 
And we recommend that you take a platform approach to this. You don't want to adopt a bunch of little point solutions to get to this, right? Um, today, the typical IT organization has four to 15 network operations tools already in place. I talk to people that have 20, 30, 75. And the more tools you have, the more mistakes you make and the more complexity you have in trying to understand problems. So adding more tools increases complexity and lengthens mean time to resolution of issues and it destroys your ability to be proactive. Um, so for instance, like I've talked to people who have written scripts that do like network tests and they, they send that to um, end users who are complaining about something to execute that script on their laptop. And then they... Get the results of that script running a network test and they compare it to other things and some other tool that they've adopted and that's no way that you, you, what you that's not going to scale to thousands of users right so you, that is not an ideal approach you need something that allows you to have sort of a dashboard view of everything um, some it organizations will adopt separate tools for things like real user monitoring and network monitoring um, that are more um, scalable than you know, running test scripts or whatever. Um, but then you're introducing things like multiple agents and multiple dashboards and multiple uh, and additional overhead in terms of like managing and administering tools and actually paying for the tools as well. So what you want to do and what we see is adopting a unified multifunction platform that provides all the capabilities you need for internet performance monitoring is more ideal because then you can consolidate those agents. You have one dashboard that, that can sort of provide you um, uh, insights into multiple types of telemetry in a contextualized form. Uh, and you can consolidate costs and reduce and minimize administrative overhead. Uh, and then you want to get comprehensive internet performance visibility. You want to make sure that you're getting all the types of visibility that you think you're going to need as you're um, implementing your solution. Um, so a couple perspectives here. We uh, surveyed s several hundred people last year about their wide air networks. And we asked them, what are the biggest issues with application performance on your WAN? And the number one issue is bandwidth constraints. So you want to be able to understand that with whatever tool you adopt. And that, number two issue is latency. That one, um, most tools are going to deliver you visibility into. Um, they also want to cloud it, insight into cloud outages. Is AWS reachable right now um, in this region versus that region? Uh, and they also wanted to be able to understand ISP congestion. As my traffic traverses multiple ISPs, like which ones are introducing congestion into my network that's impacting application experience? And then we also asked network managers who, who operate hybrid WANs with lots of internet connectivity, what are the internet insights that are essential to you? And number one was we need to understand end-to-end -end loss latency and jitter across our, our network paths. Um, we also want ISP outage reporting, uh, DNS availability and resolution time, which kind of speaks to the fact that there's a lot of managed DNS services that are becoming integral to your application architectures these days, and you need reporting on that, for instance. And then also hop by hop loss latency and jitter across paths so that I can not only understand how the path is impacting things, um, uh, but also isolate a problem and go to the right uh, administrator of the source of the problem. And Seamus, if I can jump in again, one of the things that we are also trying to drive is the the idea that you want to be more user centric, right? Like every IT team wants to be more user centric and more customer experience centric. But if our tools force you to look at things like latency and CPU utilization, it's really hard to do that, right? So it, it's it's like if you're driving your car, do you really care about your mix of fuel to air ratio? Do you care about mm -hmm. care about your RPMs, or do you care about what the GPS is telling you? Like you're gonna get there in time, you have enough gas, etc. Right? Like those are the metrics that matter for the user. So that an internet performance platform should give you what is the actual experience for your users, whether they're remote workers working from home or whether they're in an office, what is the experience for your customers visiting from every part of the world that matters to you? What is the experience you're delivering to other applications via APIs and any, any other internet connectivity that needs to, needs to be up for you to, for your business to operate? Absolutely. Um, 
I'm going to get to that a little bit more in a second, but I'm going in order of my slides here just so I don't get lost. Um, you, when, you, when you adopt an IPM solution, always also think about it in terms of uh, multi-cloud visibility like and how it can help you establish multi-cloud visibility. Um, internet, IT organizations, um, as I said, are have recognized that the internet is an important connector into the cloud, whether it's like users reaching the cloud directly from their homes, um, corporate sites connecting to the cloud, your data center connecting to the cloud, or clouds connecting to each other. Internet may play a role in any of those, uh, depending on the choices you make in terms of architecture. Um, and so network teams told us that they're prioritizing uh, observability of these three things for the multi-cloud networks. They want to understand cloud data center interconnections, which may be an internet-based connection or may not, depending on, as I said, your choices. They want to understand cloud-to-cloud -cloud interconnections. And finally, they want to understand site-to-cloud connectivity uh, or end-user experience from their corporate sites. So they want to understand how their corporate offices are, are connecting into the cloud and what the health of that connection is. And now 42% of IT teams that we surveyed about the subject of um, uh, remote and hybrid work and its impact on IT operations, 42% of them told us that they're now using a synthetic network monitoring tool to improve their internet visibility from remote locations. Maybe it is something where they've deployed agents into the home, the, the um, the uh, client devices of their remote workers, or they're just using vantage points across the internet to understand how users are being impacted in certain regions, or more ideally, they're doing both, that they've adopted a unified platform that offers a lot of functionality. Now, we also asked them, what are some of the capabilities in the platform that you need once you've adopted a, a new sort of internet performance monitoring tool to address remote work? The first thing they said is that we want to have better integration with um, our ticketing and ITSM solutions so that when there's a problem, the ticket has a lot of information about things like how the internet's impacting the situation, hopefully, um, but also, um, for instance, maybe that, that ticketing system uh, or the IT service management system might have information about the home, the user's home office network setup that it can send in a, a ticket to your network operations team through your internet performance monitoring solution. So that is, you're looking at an alert or something in your platform, or if you're looking at a specific user in your dashboard, there might be a possibility of pulling data from ITSM into that. Speaking of looking at things from a user perspective, they want dashboard reporting that is based on end users. Five years ago, um, most network operations teams, if they're looking at things from like um, a global point of view in their tools, they would be looking at sites. Here's my LA office. Here's my New York office. Here's my London office. How's the network doing all those places? It may have been the internet uh, involved at that point. But now, instead of three offices uh, supporting, uh, let's say, 5,000 employees, it's maybe like 4,000 of those employees were in 4,000 sites, their homes. And so now you need to adjust your dashboarding so that you can look at things from that end user experience point of view, right? And see reports on here are my top 10 users who are having problems. Um, here are uh, the five regions where we have home office workers that are being affected by ISP issues, right? Things like that. Um, and then they want to be able to understand connectivity state from the client device perspective. So being able to get some stats on what is happening with their local connection and, and out into the internet from the end user pro uh, agent that, that might be deployed on a client device. And finally, um, start thinking about how you can leverage advanced analytics and AI ops technology or artificial intelligence, machine learning technologies. Um, a lot of vendors in observability in general, but internet performance monitoring in particular in, in this context are starting to uh, develop AI capabilities to sort of Make, their, make you more efficient and also deliver a lot of automation in, in operations. So we surveyed several hundred people recently who had experience with applying such technologies to IT ops and network operations in general. And 92% of them said that they expect that the application of AI to IT ops and net ops um, is going to lead to better business outcomes for them. Very general question, but 
it shows that most people are seeing that this isn't just hype. There's potential here. 69% of the organizations who told us that they have applied AI to IT operations and network operations so far uh, re reported that they've observed an improvement in overall end user experience in their enterprise. So that is more concrete results, right? Um, we asked them what kinds of benefits that they're experiencing or expecting to experience when they start applying analytics and AI to IT operations and network operations. They see an opportunity for network optimization. So just making their network more efficient, more um, fine-tuned to serve the needs of the business uh, with an eye on total cost, uh, more network agility. They can be more um, um, proactive in how they uh, make changes to the network and respond to problems, uh, improve security and compliance, um, a more resilient network, just less downtime, fewer um, performance issues impacting user experience, and overall operational efficiency. They're able to spend less time on repetitive tasks. They're able to, to fix problems more quickly, um, and they can get things done with fewer people. So those are some of the opportunities we see. And then use cases that people tell us that they're really interested in. They look, they, they're really interested in automated troubleshooting. So a tool that can perhaps tell you through um, visualization and, and natural language, here's a problem, we've isolated it to this issue. This is what we think is causing the problem. And here's something that would probably fix the issue. And then maybe even like, would you like to fix the issue? <laughs> Click here, uh, depending on what tool you're working in. Um, also intelligent alerting. New, tools are extremely noisy these days. Um, the majority of alerts that come out of IT monitoring tools are usually uh, um, false alarms or just you know things that need to be acknowledged but don't indicate that something must be fixed. And it's really hard to find um, the alerts that need to be responded to. Uh, AI can uh, triage alerts, can do event correlation, and can do things such as prevent one, one um, incident with maybe 20, 30, 100 alarms behind it that have been abstracted away so that you can respond to what needs to be done as opposed to trying to sort through alerts. Uh, and then predictive capacity management, being able to say, uh, based on um, patterns that we're seeing that, that are dynamic and that would not be recognized by like a, a rule that you put in manually, but something that we're seeing through long-term trending and predictive uh, analysis, we think that this internet link is going to be oversubscribed within uh, five, five months, things like that, or will be temporarily oversubscribed at Christmas, uh, <laughs> something like that. So those are things to think about with the opportunities around advanced analytics. Uh, so final thoughts from me, uh, the internet is essential to modern digital architecture. It's, enable, it's, 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 an, it's enabling hybrid WAN, hybrid and multi-cloud networks and remote work, and you need visibility into it. Traditional observability does not account for the mutability and the instability of that in, internet-based infrastructure that we've gone through exhaustively today. Um, and internet performance monitoring solutions can close the observability gap if you select a solution that offers you a unified multifunction platform with analytics and uh, multiple vantage points and et cetera. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Gerarda who's gonna tell you a few more insightful things and then we'll take some questions after that. That's great, thank you, Seamus. So yes, I, I we we see the same like the internet is your network, distributed, complex, and fragile. If you if you look at even your your own company's website, it will, you might be surprised by looking at how many dependencies from third party systems and how many DNS calls and how many ISPs and how many clouds are involved in just delivering one page. It's actually a bit of a miracle that all that happens within just three or four seconds. So it's it's critically important to recognize that the internet is not only your network, but it's actually more complex and more fragile than what we would like to recognize. Uh, it was not designed certainly for billions of users and the level of trust and the level of complexity that we see today. If we wanna to go to the next slide. Yeah, so a lot of things can go wrong in the internet, right? Like we we see everything from BGP hijacks, which when they happen, they're, they're terrible, uh, latency, uh, human errors, configuration changes, DNS failures, uh, SASE incidents or SA even migration to different SASE technologies might have an impact to your users. Like the internet is not only complex, but also very changing very quickly. If you go to the next slide, Seamus, 
And all, all this complexity on the internet, we, we like to think about it as the internet stack. For, for years, we've been familiar with the, I don't know, seven layers of OSI for networking or the application stack or the three-tier application infrastructure. I think it's useful to think about the internet complexity and organize it in, in a way that illustrates that there's so many things that you need to understand about this, this new dependencies and then all the things that need to work for your business to work. Right. And and this also illustrates the need for new tools because an, an NPM, traditional NPM solution has no context of uh, maybe a CDNs, right? Or what BGP is. Uh, most APM tools have no visibility into BGP at all. And, and so there are new protocols, new systems, new technologies that need to be deployed as part of the new platform to be able to see in, inside that internet stack. Go to the next slide. And so the, the idea of internet the internet stack, something you monitor with IPM, and the application stack you monitor with IPM. And like Shane was mentioned, both might use similar technologies like synthetics and ROM, but they might be used in a different way or from a, from a, with a different objective, right? So it, it's like saying, well, you can use a knife for multiple purposes. That doesn't make, mean that the chef is the same or, or that you know a Mexican restaurant and a Chinese restaurant are gonna produce the same food with, with, with a knife. In this case, uh, the application stack is, is something that the APM tools have been designed to monitor and, and the internet is designed to, to be monitored with the, with the IPM set of tools. Synthetics and ROM are, are very different between these two systems and they, there's a lot of specialization, not only in the protocols, but also in how synthetics, synthetics is, is, is executed. Uh, go to the next slide. And one of those main differences is the ability to look at things from multiple vantage points. Mo most APM tools will monitor from the cloud, right? Like if you, you, you might choose, like you want to run your synthetic test from, I don't know, AWS East. And that will tell you what your application looks like from that vantage point. The key is that that's, that's very useful if you're an application developer trying to validate functionality and trying to get an, a general idea of how your application behaves in, in somewhat of a real world scenario. The thing is, most people, most companies don't have customers in AWS East, but they have customers in New York connected to a mobile device or in, in Chicago working in an office on Walker Street, or maybe you have some customers that might be connected to Starlink. And if you really care about users and user experience, it's important to understand what is the experience you're delivering to those users and to those customers. And, and so that's why this idea of having vantage points was not only the number of vantage points, but the ability to look inside the infrastructure that your, your users are relying on gives you that visibility to understand what where the problems are and what is a real world is, if experience that you're delivering to applications, API, workforce, and users. Next slide. And so as, as Seamus was saying, you, you really want to be proactive. You cannot just ask your, your help desk team to run scripts every time somebody complains, right? So this is the idea of this AI ops to help you identify what is the real experience? Where do I, like the key point is how do I become proactive and how do I identify the areas of my business that require attention? So with, with a tool like this, you can see, well, you know, your users in New York connected through Verizon are having an, a bad experience or your customers uh, connected through AT&T in the Southeast United States, or your your customers in China are having an issue, right? And that gives you an opportunity to understand, well, is this an ISP issue? Do I need to talk to them about routing? Do I need to suggest a different uh, technology or a different third-party provider for my customers? And it allows you to identify, is a problem with the application, whether it's SaaS or your application, or is it the user itself? Is it their connectivity between the user and the internet? Or is it a regional issue that is having uh, having a problem? So more correlation to help you find what is the root cause of issues, more proactive focus, and more importantly, the, the idea that you will be measuring things from a user perspective, right? Because again, 13% higher latency, what does that mean? Does that really matter or not? What really matters is that you, you set your thresholds, your SLAs of what you expect for your users, internal and external, and you're able to meet that, and you are able to detect any changes ahead of time before they actually become a complaint before they impact your business. Next slide. And, and so that's what makes Catchpoint special. We are one of maybe only two internet performance monitoring platforms out there 
And the way that we specialize, or the, the way that make what makes Catching special is re really one, monitoring what matters. We've invested 15 years in monitoring every single aspect of the internet from BGP to CDN, et cetera. Monitoring from where it matters, all this network of, of, of nodes around the world in inside infrastructure with different types of endpoints and last mile networks and inside your, your own company, the ability to deploy enterprise nodes. And then last, the, the ability to catch issues before they become incidents using AI ops to focus on the customer experience, to be proactive and to find the root cause faster than what you could do without these tools. And I think my last slide is basically like what the what is the end goal? Like if you have all this stuff, you would imagine you have already most large companies have a knock and you have a sock, right? And those are mostly reactive, like what's broken. Now imagine you could have a digital operational center that shows you what is the digital experience you're delivering. Like this actually helps you become more of a partner to the business. Our, our internal applications enabling the great experiences. What is the health of our IT systems? Can our employees be productive? Our branches, stores, if you're a bank, your ATMs, if you're a retail location, like is, is the payment system working? Like is our, our customers really having good experience? Our websites, APIs. Like I think all of us, if, if you've ever traveled, you, you have experience like, sorry, my computer is low when you go rent a car, right? Like that, that it doesn't need to be that way. Uh, IT could be the business part of the changes that are from here are your keys, right? To sorry, my computer's low. And my last slide, I think, is basically um, next one. The reason why uh, Catchman's been doing for 15 years, nine out of the top 10 four digital companies users, the, all the top cloud providers, pretty much every single large CDM providers, the largest software companies use Catchpoint because they, they value this digital experience because they understand the importance of monitoring the internet. They see the value of internet performance monitoring and, and they, they appreciate this concept of how do I achieve internet resilience? And so I want to thank Seamus and everybody who's been uh, listening to us. And, and my last slide has uh, two links. One is a, a link to download the white paper that, that Seamus wrote about this topic. And, and the second link is just go visit catchpoint.com. We have a lot of educational materials. We, we don't register our educational like white papers and stuff like that. We won't ask you to give us your email or phone number. So uh, thank you, Seamus. Any, any last thoughts that you want to add? Yeah, just uh, you're talking about the Digital Operations Center, and we are seeing at EMA, we're seeing a, a shift away from standalone NOC and SOC and, uh, organ organizations to um, a cross-domain ops center that sort of focuses on services more than than silos. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not like a wholesale shift of everybody, but sure. it, but but the shift is is more. Um, uh, prominent in like down market, like companies that have 10,000 or fewer employees, the larger companies are still sticking with their standalone knock and their stock and stuff. But those, those more agile IT organizations are embracing that approach that you were describing a couple slides ago. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and thank you, Riley, for posting the links on the chat for everybody to have, be able to click on them easier than time to type this long URL. Of course, no problem. Um, I will also include it in the follow-up email, so be sure to check that out. I think we're now ready for questions, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into them, starting with you, Gerardo. Is APM obsolete now? Well, well, no. I, I, APM is still useful. I, I think there are some aspects of APM, like understanding resource utilization. In the past, you had like one server reporting one application or a cluster of servers, now that you have auto scaling and dynamically provisioned infrastructure on the cloud, is is less about how do you run, make sure that the application runs, but the visibility into infrastructure helps you manage your costs, right? Like it, it, the shift of infrastructure monitoring shifted a little bit, but but still, I think that development teams will still need APM for many years to come. Uh, but but they, I would say that APM is insufficient, as Seamus explained, because it doesn't show you the, the full picture. A, a true operations team needs to have APM to look at kind of the internals of the application, but also IPM to understand the real world experience that users are experiencing through the internet uh, for the application itself. Thank you for that explanation. Seamus, jumping over to you, SD-WAN products have native monitoring. Why doesn't that solve internet WAN visibility? Um, 
most SD WAN vendors uh, offer uh, good insight into the overlay that they form on top of your your WAN underlay, which you know might include multiple ISPs, um, maybe some M MPLS as well. Um, they do not provide deep visibility into some of the, the metrics that something like Catchpoint provides um, around like global internet performance, BGP routing, things like that. Um, and also not gonna solve you know, remote user connectivity unless you're deploying SD-WAN boxes into your homes, the homes of your employees. Uh, so most of the um, companies that we talk to who have adopted SD-WAN are usually monitoring it with a third-party tool because they find the native visibility is insufficient to help them understand how the internet is impacting uh, overall network performance. Thanks, Seamus. And why aren't the performance metrics and reports from cloud providers like CloudWatch good enough? So from, you know, for cloud, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, um, uh, cl cl those kinds of reports are equivalent to relying on an APM solution to some extent, although not as, in, 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 <laughs> not as detailed or, or granular um, and not as useful in formatting as well. Uh, so if those types of uh, native reporting can um, give you an insight into like how an individual cloud provider is supporting you, but one, if that cloud provider goes down, you're not going to get any of that information because they're not reporting anything when their cloud is down. Uh, two, if you're multi-cloud, it's going to be hard for you to correlate across multiple environments, um, mul multiple cloud providers with that kind of reporting because that reporting is not end-to-end. Um, -end, and also the way it's delivered to you and formatted is going to be highly variable from provider to provider. So most of the people we talk to are using third-party tools to get better visibility into a hybrid multi-cloud environment. And if I can add a little bit to that, you know, just use a real world example. Two months ago, Adobe had an issue with their Adobe Tag Manager that is being used by a lot of e-commerce websites. So some e-commerce IT operations found the problem with the, they were getting complaints, where their sales were low. The worst scenario is you get a call from the CEO. It's like, what's going on with our website? You have no idea. You, you call, you go into the cloud, everything looks good. You don't know what's broken, right? Uh, contrast that with one of our customers uh, who sells sneakers, and they they get on the alert from the catchment system saying that Adobe Tag Manager is down immediately. In fact, I think we 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 told them 20 minutes before Adobe actually announced their, their, their incident externally. So they quickly make a change to the website, avoiding to use the Adobe Tag Manager, and they their impact to their business was minimal. Right, and the person, more importantly, they were in control. So they got a call from the CEO, hey, what happened 10 minutes ago? It's like, oh, Adobe Tag Manager was down, we fixed it, problem solved, right? And by the time Adobe announced it, they, they were already in control and they had already fixed the problem. So my point there is really that the the, the cloud, even though your majority of your applications might be in the cloud, every connect, piece of connectivity might, might still be dependency. Most of your applications will depend on third-party APIs on other clouds. There might be components of an application are hosted somewhere else. And you need to have visibility into everything that is a dependency because any one of those dependencies can, can break your system. Like another example is two years ago when, when Facebook had a BGP incident and everything related to Meta, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram was down, even to the point where they, they, the IT people were not able to access their data centers because their, their access cards were not able to authenticate them as users because there was not enough connectivity to an identity management system because that identity management system relied on BGP as well. Thank you both for your insights. The next question I'll throw out, uh, you can both provide your insights. This attendee wants to know, you pointed out remote users are on the rise, working from hotels, coffee shops, and homes. How can seeing the performance issues help if there's nothing that can be done other than ordering people back to the office? I'm gonna That's tackle this great... one first because um, I really like this question and I saw it come in. Um, and uh, so last year I surveyed 350 or so people who are trying to adapt network operations to serve the needs of hybrid and remote workers. And one of the questions we asked them was, what are important measures for uh, 
or what are the metrics that you're using to understand whether or not you're serving the needs of remote workers well? And mean time to repair was pretty low on the list. What was important was mean time to acknowledge and mean time to insight. Uh, because people who are working from a coffee shop are going to be, they're going to recognize that they're not an ideal environment. And if you can give them to an answer that tells them, hey, it's because you're working in that coffee shop that the problem is bad, that actually will satisfy them and motivate them to go to a better location if they can. Um, now, if they're in a home office and let's say they're complaining about something, uh, you can tell them, well, you know what? Your ISP has been <laughs> doing this for the past three months. You might motivate them to switch ISPs. Um, get rid of the garbage one they're using and replace it with the tier one provider, for instance, or um, make the argument to your corporate management to reimburse critical users for better ISP uh, uh, adoption. Be like, hey, we need these users to use better internet connections. I can document and audit how this is impacting the business. Let's provide them with, with some sort of uh, uh, compensation for, for upgrading their net connection or something as simple as like, you know, with the right tooling on that agent, you might be able to say, you know, your, your Wi-Fi connection is really spotty in your home right now. How far away are you from the router? Um, maybe you should, uh, move to a different room or open the door, see what happens. I've actually had that happen to me <laughs> in support calls. Um, where that fixed my issue. Uh, moving the router out from behind something. Um, these are not necessarily things that tools might uh, allow you to do, but it can sort of t point you towards um, um, uh, clues that can sort of close the knowledge gap in trying to triage a certain issue. And if I can add to that, the, the, I think the main reason is confidence. Right, because if a user is complaining that they are in a co coffee shop and they're not being able to log into Salesforce, let's say they're a salespeople, salesperson, you might want to assume that it's a coffee shop that there's a problem, but you need to be confident because you're asking that person go to another coffee shop, go home, go to the hotel, and if that doesn't solve the problem, you just made them waste an hour of their time, and they're going to have a bigger incident, right? So we have an agent actually can be deployed on, on your laptop and can tell you, for example, what is the health of your CPU and memory? We've seen cases where, you know, you have a ton of applications open. So you're, it's really your, your, your CPU or your computer that is, that is, you know, creating the contention of resources. We actually can measure the quality of the network between your laptop and the router, the router and the ISP, et cetera. Real world example, we had one company based in the UK who is a movie production uh, powerhouse that most people would know. And they, they were getting a lot of users to complain. They could not find, again, it, everything looked green on their side. Their APM tools told them everything was good, but they still had a lot of use customers that, that were having trouble. They installed Catchpoint in five minutes. We told them, look, all your users in Manchester connected through Sky are having an issue. The IT manager called Sky, fixed the routing issue, and suddenly a couple hundred employees had a much better experience. We had something similar with, with an, an issue in, in internal network configuration issue with a very large uh, laptop manufacturer, global, couple thousand employees. Some complained, some didn't complain. And this improved the productivity of thousands of people by just finding exactly what was the issue. The confidence thing that you mentioned is very important, not just from an overall operations perspective, but it's a component of the mean time to acknowledge, mean time to insight piece that you can deliver to that end user that you're interacting with. If you can tell them, hey, it's not Salesforce, it's 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 where you are. That 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 knowledge um, resolves for them the issue. Like they they know and they will adjust their work or their environment knowing that it's where they are in the, it, it, I'm seeing some p comments in, in here about people who said, you know, we pay, one guy just said, I, I moved, we, we paid for, for one guy, one guy to upgrade to one gigabit internet from 50 megabits per second, but it's still an issue because there's too much Wi-Fi interference. Uh, and then we updated the Wi-Fi in the house and the, the issue seemed worse. <laughs> so yeah, it's 
you know, it's it's we're still in the the, the the think of this as like the the wild west, you know, like we're moving west into homes, <laughs> and we're still figuring out uh lo the laws. We're still um you know there's still people shooting it out in the streets. Um, I think I think there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done from an architectural perspective. Um, visibility, observability, what we're talking about here is very important. But um, there are also architectural things you need to think about, like people looking for ways to fight yeah, Wi-Fi interference or, you know, yes, OK, so I've, we're using zero trust network access and it's made things worse. Well, then you need to think about observability into, for instance, the ZTNA points of presence that are that your provider maintains and an Internet performance monitoring solution uh, might help you with that, actually, as well, because then you can see where those those points of presence from your ZTNA provider are and, you know, what kind of latency they're adding to the connection. Um, are there other points of presence that you should be considering as an alternative for certain users who are, you know, hairpinning across the continent for some reason? Things like that are, uh, also are architectural issues that better visibility can help you with. That's a great point because we see a lot, one of the main use cases that IT departments use cash point for is evaluating multiple providers like VPN, CTNA, SASE. You can ex understand from a real world user experience what latency, what packet loss, what is a real world experience for somebody connected to one CTNA vendor versus another one? Uh, what is your global exposure? And, and also hold them accountable for SLAs, right? And this is not only for those, but even for CDNs. And as Seamus, as you were saying, most companies are multi-cloud. We, we see that most of the global companies we work with they have not only multiple clouds, but they have multiple CDNs. They have multiple SASE vendors. And you might decide that, you know, that we have a bunch of users, like going back to this company, maybe you have a lot of users in Manchester and you're using Cscaler and that's really bad for people in Manchester. You might just want to switch into one of your other VPN providers. or you might, you know, make it somewhat decision long-term to switch to a different SASE vendor. That, that is extremely useful. And it goes back to having the confidence that you know is the SASE technology at the same time your users is not the coffee shop, is not the laptop, is not the application itself, right? That that's really where, where it comes down to just knowing the answer to what's impacting the user. Hmm. Great insights. Thank you both. Gerardo, how should organiza organizations think about IPM? Who should own it? Well, we see more and more companies uh, adopt IPM in the same teams that are using APM and NPM, meaning that we see a lot of consolidation into uh, observability teams, right? Like there, there's an IKEA, for example, has this team called the Digital um, Operational Intelligence Team. This is basically their observability team, and it becomes one of their tools they use. We have customers like SAP who uh, are now, that basically their team is AIPM a squared. So it means that it's APM plus IPM. Uh, but also we see a lot of people like in, in IT help desk or, or other operations teams, even SASE leadership that want to not only monitor the, the network connectivity of their own developer users, but also the uptime of all the applications that their DevOps teams rely on, right? Like you, you might rely on Jira and, and Jenkins and PagerDuty. All, most of these are hosted in the cloud and if cloud goes down, you have zero visibility. And so who, we're basically monitoring the monitors, monitoring the tool set, et cetera. So uh, it, it, there are many, many use cases, but we see, especially in large companies, centralization of the of the uh, observability tools into, into one team that is either managing the tools or providing general guidance and governance. I don't know, Seamus, if you see the same. Yeah, I mean, I focus, my research is mostly focused on um, network engineering and operations. So I, I look at it from that perspective, but there's a lot of um, sharing of tools. Um, and yeah, I think th there are digital experience management teams, there are network operations teams, uh, there are application operations, or application management teams that all might want to own uh, an internet monitoring tool. Um, and I, I think it would, um, I, I think like the future is it being a shared tool across groups if, you know, there is a, 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 an internal culture that encourages that. I even see like security teams being inter interested in internet performance monitoring tools because it can help them with compliance. They can see where paths are going across their network, um, uh, understand whether, you know, something like, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, data sovereignty, for instance, like being able to confirm that, all the data 
is staying in a certain location. Um, but yeah, I think shared tools is the future uh, for something like Cashpoint. Great. Thank you both. And I wanted to thank our audience for taking time out of your schedule to join us. As I mentioned, you will be receiving a follow-up email from EMA that will include resources from today's event. So be sure to check that email out. Thank you again for joining us. And I hope we'll see you at a future EMA research webinar. I appreciate your help, Seamus and Riley. Thanks, Thank everybody, for joining. Bye, everyone. Cheers.